It's not a main topic of this course, but I want to give you some idea where random numbers come from. That is to say, if you have a univariate probability distribution, how do you draw random values? They're called random deviates from that distribution. I'm not going to discuss the starting point, which is how you get uniform random numbers out of a computer. Uniform, capital U, of 0, 1, that means a uniform deviate between 0 and 1, where every representable value on the computer between 0 and 1 has an equal probability of being generated. Instead, we're going to ask, what do you do for other distributions? How do you build up this U01 generator into more general cases? The important point is that generators need to be very fast because when you're doing computer simulations you're often going to call them millions or billions of times. Let's talk about three general methods. The first method is called the transformation method. The idea is that you have some probability distribution, P of y, that I've written here, where y is the independent variable, and you want to draw random numbers from that probability distribution. Now let's suppose you're in the happy case where you can compute analytically by doing an indefinite integral this curve, which is the CDF of the probability distribution, that is to say capital F of y, which is the integral from 0, or whatever the left edge is of the distribution, to y of p of y. And that will, of course, start at 0 when we're at the left edge and rise to the value 1, the area under the curve, when we're at the right edge. Let's further suppose that we're in the lucky case that f of y is an analytic function that you can invert analytically. That means that instead of computing f of y, you'll be able to, to compute y of f. Now look what happens. Suppose we pick a uniform random deviate between 0 and 1 along this axis here. Maybe it's here. Then we use the inverse function of f to go from here to this curve and get out a value of y. And what I claim is that that value of y will have a probability distribution of the original p of y. Why is that true? It's because of areas under the curve. If we, for example, happen to pick a point at exactly the 50% point here, then we'll go over here and we'll end up at the position where the area to the left of us under the curve is 50%. So if for each value of y, we have the corresponding probability that the area to the curve to the left of us is the area under the curve p of y, then obviously we're generating the distribution p of y. Now let's make things slightly more complicated with a method that's called the rejection method. Here we're going to relax some of the assumptions we had before. We'll have some probability distribution that we want to draw from. Here we're going to call it p of x. And I've drawn it in this sort of lumpy, bumpy way to show that it's unlikely that you'll be able to compute analytically its CDF and, moreover, the inverse of its CDF. But now we're going to suppose that you do something simpler. You find some function, any function, f of x, that bounds p of x, that lies everywhere above it, and that, by the way, has finite area. Then we're going to compute the CDF, except it's not quite a CDF, the indefinite integral of f of x, and that will be this solid curve that now goes, starts at 0 on the left-hand side, but now goes not to 1 because f is very everywhere above a probability distribution p, so it goes to just some arbitrary constant a here. How do we generate a random deviate from p of x using this? somewhat the same as the transformation method, we take a random deviate and scale it so that it lies anywhere between 0 and a. That gives us a value here, and we use the inverse of f's CDF, or indefinite integral, to come into this point here and pick a value of x0. That's our trial output value for a deviate, but we don't always output it. 
Instead, we note that the curve F lies above the curve P by a certain factor here, we could say. And what we do is we choose a second uniform random deviate between 0 and f of x0 up here. Now if that random deviate is smaller than the value p of x here, then we're done. We output that as the random value. But if it's larger, then we don't output it, we reject it, and we go back to ground zero. We start with the first random deviate in here, and we continue the process and we'll, until we're able to accept an x0. What fraction of the time do we have to reject? Because clearly that's the inefficiency of the method. Well, you might think it's a complicated calculation because it depends on the variation of the distance here between the f and the p. But if you step back a step, you'll see that it only depends on the relative areas. In other words, if the area of f, which is a, is made smaller and smaller, then the fraction of the time we're going to land in that area and have to reject in the little white region here gets smaller and smaller. So the fraction of time we reject is simply a minus 1. And the tighter you can make your function f of x in hugging p of x, the less often you'll have to reject. Now let's look at a sophisticated method that combines some of the best features of both the transformation method and the rejection method. This is a very non-obvious method. Let's just do it as a little prescription first and then we'll see why it works. Okay, we're given a probability distribution P and we're going to look at two different variables, U and V, and in that UV plane we're going to construct a shape, it's usually going to look something like a teardrop, which is bounded by which is defined by this equation. That is to say, 0 is less than or equal to u is less than or equal to the square root of p of v over u. What a strange formula. What's going on here? It's easiest to think of v over of lines of constant v over u because that's the x, the argument in the p here. So here's a typical line of constant v over u. And this inequality says that we should allow u to vary from 0 along this line up to some point where it equals p of v over u, and that will define the locus of this intersection, in other words, of the black curve here. Why is it often a teardrop? Well, let's imagine the slope of this line, v over u, starting off at minus infinity, so it's a vertical line kind of coming down from here. And then as we increase the slopes, you'll see if you follow my arrow that as p increases to, say, a peak value, if it's bell-shaped, we'll go out farther and farther in u. So we might go to here at zero slope. And then as the slope gets positive, v over u gets positive, maybe p decreases because it's kind of bell-shaped and it'll come back in, and then as the argument goes to infinity, the probability of infinity has got to go to zero, otherwise the area under the curve couldn't be one. So we come back in here to the origin of the teardrop. So that's why for kind of your typical lumpy bell-shaped looking probability distribution, this region will be teardrop shaped. So what do we do? You pick two deviates, u and v, that lie uniformly within the teardrop, and then you return v divided by u as the deviate. That's why it's called the ratio of uniforms method. How do you pick uniformly within the teardrop? Well, the easiest way is, once again, a rejection method. You pick u and v uniformly in this rectangle, and then you reject if it's outside the teardrop and return the value v over u if it's inside the teardrop. So this seems quite mystical. Why does this work? Let's prove it. I'm going to start by writing down what seems to be a kind of a trivial formula. I'm going to write down that as a function of the variable I'm interested in and the distribution I'm interested in, 
p of x dx is equal to an integral of a new dummy variable p prime from 0 to the value p of x dp prime dx. Well, what makes this trivial is that this integral can just be done giving the value p of x, which therefore makes this equation true. But another way of thinking about this form of the equation is it says that there's a plane, a p prime x plane, in which we want to pick a value of x uniformly in this little square of, of uh, infinitesimals dp prime dx. So we're getting back at the same idea that we had in the rejection method or in the transformation method of picking uniformly within an area. Now what's the trick? Watch closely. We're going to just make a change of variables in the p prime x plane. So I'm going to just pick these out of thin air. I'm not sure how somebody discovered this in the first place, but it's easy to check. Let's define v over u equals x, no surprise because we saw that before in the formula, and u squared equals p. And now how do I write this integral in terms of u and v instead of p and x? Well the answer is the integral I'm interested in, which is this thing, is just an integral in u and v over the same region that I'm interested in, and then I have to have a Jacobian determinant that converts the little areas in d prime, in p prime x into little areas in u v. And the important point is I also have to figure out how the limits transform in this equation. Well, when p equals 0, u equals 0, that's the origin of the teardrop. And for any value p of x, we saw this formula for the other side of the p teardrop, that u is equal to the square root of p of x. But what about this weird Jacobian determinant? Ah, if you just take these equations and calculate the Jacobian determinant, you'll see that magically it's constant. It's simply the value 2. And so we get this formula with, once again, no integrand. And that shows that if we pick uniformly in the uv plane, but subject to the limits of this integral that say we have to be within the teardrop, then we'll get the desired probability distribution x. I agree that this is not very intuitive, but it's kind of neat. Oh, here I was just illustrating how the limits of u correspond to points along the teardrop, and therefore the integral is over the interior of the teardrop. Now the ratio of uniforms method is particularly powerful when it's combined with an, uh, another idea, and that idea is the idea of a squeeze. So suppose we have, for our probability distribution of interest, some I'm calling it a teardrop, but some curve here that came out of the ratio of uniforms method. Um, here I've drawn a family of curves that aren't curves at all. They're weird sort of uh, step staircase kinds of things. And these actually come from a probability distribution. They come from the binomial distribution, which is integer valued, so that when you view it as a continuous function, it's little square steps rather than a smooth curve. And I've used that just as an example to show that you can have any complicated shaped teardrop in here. Now the idea of a squeeze is find simple functions that lie everywhere inside the teardrop of interest and everywhere outside the teardrop of interest. And by simple functions, I mean functions that with a very small number of operations let you compute are you inside or outside of those shapes. So now you see this rejection method in the UV plane becomes much more efficient. Because if I'm outside the outer squeeze, I know that I'm going to reject. And if I'm inside the inner squeeze, I know I'm going to accept. And it's only in the case that I'm between the squeezes that I actually have to go off and evaluate 
the probability distribution that I'm interested in, which may be something complicated to evaluate. So the idea is make the squeezes as tight as possible around the actual teardrop to get a very, very efficient algorithm. An example of this is what's called Leva's algorithm that returns normal deviates. So I won't go this through this in detail other than to point out that it picks random deviates, random uniform deviates in the UV plane and that does a little transformation on them to get a couple of variables that are going to be the variables that define the inner and outer squeeze. And then there's some logic as to whether you're outside the outer squeeze or inside the inner squeeze. And if you track this through, it's only if you come through these ORs and the greater than or uh, through this OR function and the AND function. And to this case that you have to compute, well in this case it's not even that hard a function to compute. It's a logarithm. But logarithm is slower than just a couple of multiplies and adds. And it turns out that Leva was able to construct squeezes that are so good that you only even have to compute a logarithm 1% of the time in the UV area and otherwise with just a few arithmetic operations you can return an exact normal deviate. You might wonder how the normal deviate can be exact if the constants here are only given to six significant figures. And yet, you'll have to believe me on this, in principle, the returned deviate is exact all the way up to its double precision, say, 15 significant figures. Well, the answer should be pretty obvious if you've followed the previous slide. We don't have to have any particularly unique squeeze. We just have to have a pretty good squeeze. So the squeeze just defined, both the inner and outer squeeze just defined to six significant figures is good enough to get this 1%, a number much larger than 10 to the minus 6, to get this 1% bound on the true teardrop shape. That's all for random deviates. It's a great subject, but it's not the subject of this course beyond this small introduction.